Hi, everyone. And thank you for tuning in to Deborah Cobalt Live. We can't really always get what we want. I try. I do the best I can. How about you? Do my best. <laughs> I'm talking to my guest today, who is Laura Hopper, uh, a friend and a new author. Uh, you've worked in the film industry for some years, and currently you are an executive book editor over at Disney, which I, I find very interesting. And a lot of your projects, actually, you work through... Um, uh, ABC Television, ESPN, right? So right. you develop books for them. That's right. It's a great job. It is a great job. You know, that's really I a very it. interesting job. And I guess after leafing through so many books, you decided, I'm going to take a stab at it, right? It was a little backwards, actually. Oh, is that right? Yeah. It was before I started working as a book editor, mm -hmm. I had this idea. I had never written anything before in my life other than, you know, some emails and postcards. Yeah. And I, but I worked with writers from the beginning of my career as yeah. a manager, as a producer. And whenever I had an idea, typically I would throw it out to a writer that I worked with. But I, this idea came to me, and it was the first time I thought, I think I have a handle on that. First, let's talk about your book. Okay. This idea is I Never, and it's about... It's a novel about the first time. Your first time. Now, what do you think we're talking about? We're talking about your first time, your first sexual experience. And generally, it's I would assume that it's more about teenagers. And in this case, it's about a young girl, right? A junior in high school. And her first love is a senior. And uh, I'll let you take it away a little bit. But um, it's, it's a real up and down sort of ride. As I was reading it, I was gripping, you know, the side of the bed because I thought, what's going to happen now? What's going to happen? He's going to be graduating. I was nervous for her, you know, because I went through that. And I was reliving so much of what I went through when I was in high school and a little bit of the angst. But I have to tell you, your character handles it better than I did. <laughs> well, it is a bit of kind of the fantasy, the perfect version of it. But the funny thing is it's, it's a YA novel. So it is geared toward young readers. It's geared mm -hmm. toward high school readers. But, I loved it. But I was going to say is women of all ages who have had a chance to read it, whether it's at the publishing company or for marketing, have said it's so nostalgic. It brings me back to high school. It brings me back to what my first time was or could have been. So I think, and in fact, a man in his 40s read it and said, oh, I wish I'd read this when I was 15. I would know what girls wanted. I would have been more it, like Luke. Yeah. You know? Right. Like it should be required reading for boys to figure out how to do this. Well, maybe it could be. You know, <laughs> it's really a loving book. Thank you. Um, so basically you chose to wrote this, write this a little bit based on your own experience or what? Not really. Got in your head to do this. I'll tell you, I would si I'm would. i a baseball mom, like you're a baseball mom, and I was sitting in the stands one night, and I listened to chatter among moms of all ages and how their lives were changed by Fifty Shades Grey. And it was a reminder. Exactly. Sorry. It was a reminder that, God, women are really hungry to read the juicy details. Can I just interrupt you for a minute? Sure. I remember being at the IPIC watching Fifty Shades of Grey and everybody's like, oh my God, this is like so amazing. Oh, wait till you see what's happening next. I'm thinking, this is horrible. <laughs> this is just bad. Well, First of all, it's bad sex, bad acting, bad everything. Even the book was horrible. I mean, I just couldn't get through any of it. I right? never so saw the you. movie. I read about 100 <laughs> pages before I gave up. But the lesson was... There's a thirst for it. And I remembered when I was in eighth grade and I read Judy Bloom's Forever and I had the good parts dog-eared. And there were certain pages that we went back to over and over again. And then I realized... You slipped into bed and you were just <laughs> opening it up to that, that little area again. It's like, oh. And I realized <laughs> there was nothing in the YA market that satisfied that need. And I thought, well, what? where is that juicy, sexy story? But as opposed to Fifty Shades, a healthy story, a healthy relationship, a relationship to emulate. And I thought, what if we told the story of a first everything, first love, first experience, but in detail? You have a teenage daughter. I do. How does she feel about this? She wasn't happy. Yeah, I mean, I could imagine. I can't ask my kids anything. I have boys. <laughs> I don't have girls. And they're like, no. But, yeah. What's well, she thinking about this? the truth is, I kept it a secret while I was writing it. Because when oh. you're writing something as your first book, you think nothing's going to happen. This thing's going to die a lonely death on a shelf. No, it's on this show now. <laughs> It'll never <laughs> die a lonely death on any shelf. Because you've been here on Deborah Cobalt Live. So, no. <laughs> but go ahead. So, when... The publisher bought it. It was a preemptive offer from Houghton Mifflin. I had to go home and tell my daughter wow. that I, A, had written this and it was being published. And she was uncomfortable. And she was self-conscious. What will her friends think? What will her boyfriend think? And the truth is, it's good that it takes a year for the process for it to go on sale because she's wrapped her arms around it. She hasn't read it yet, but she's been very supportive. 
you were telling me because we, you know, we met for coffee and you were saying you were going to be giving it to her friend. And, you know, because that'll also, you know, break the ice a little bit. You know what I mean? That'll soften it. Yes. Especially her friends are going to love it. This is a terrific book. It's a great read. If it's if I enjoyed it, I know I'm pretty sure they'll enjoy it. Thank you. My daughter has said, I would probably love it if someone else had written it. Mm. She'll soften, though. She may. Especially when her friends read it, I do think. So was this based a little bit on your own experiences, though? It was not. I mean, my first love was fine. It was perfectly healthy. It wasn't ideal. And that's okay. I have no regrets. Why? It just, um, in this story, Luke Hallstrom is, you remember when we saw first, uh, 16 Candles for the first time? Yeah. And Jake Ryan was the perfect boy. Absolutely. <laughs> Luke, Luke is a version of Jake Ryan. And he, and I think no young person, boy, girl, should settle for a relationship when it's not someone who makes you feel good about your body and good about yourself and good about your sexuality. And most people, you know, that's, that's a pretty mature thing that a lot of high school kids are not capable of. That's why Luke is special. He's a little bit more self-realized. He was terrific. I mean, you know, every girl should have Luke as their first. But, you know, you also talk about things like where should your first time be? I mean, this is so complicated, really, because so many people have to go and sneak off in a corner. So many people are sneaking off in the car at the beach. And, you know, this is more of a healthy approach on where. They actually discuss it as opposed to going on a date, kissing a little bit in the car, and then the rest is history. Right. Right. And it, look, that's different for every kid because mm -hmm. some people have a lot of freedom. Some people have parents around. Some people don't have parents around. Some people have parents that are watching. So it's finding a time and place is not easy for every teenager. That's for sure. And you don't want your kid to do it in a car somewhere. Do you think most parents now, I mean, they get it that their kids are probably having their first time in high school, are sort of open to I'm going to let the house I'm going to have the house available to you. Do you think, think that goes on? More? I think most are not. You think I most think are not. most it's a little bit of a don't ask, don't tell. That's my impression. I don't know why. I mean, I grew up in a Catholic family where it was like, God help you if you were touched, kissed, anything. So I was one of those who was sneaking around. So I know what it's like and how nice. Thank God my first time he was a really, really kind and decent person. I, I chose lucky. well at the time. That's and lucky. Yeah, it is lucky. But we were sneaking around. Believe me, when his mom wasn't around and she was at work, when my parents ran out to the grocery store, because <laughs> that's all they ever did. You know, they go to the grocery store. So it's like, <laughs> come over. You know, and that that gives you anxiety, mm -hmm. you know? So getting you, caught. Yeah. Getting caught. Oh, God forbid. My dad coming in, it's like, quick, back door. Right. You know, and so you think that still is going on? I don't Probably. Know, why is there such a taboo? It's natural. I think people don't like to, to admit that they're condoning it. They might assume it's happening, but if they allow it to happen behind a closed door in their home, then they feel that they're condoning it and they don't want to be on the record. Hmm. What kind of mom are you? Well... I'm the kind of mom that gives my kids freedom as long as they've earned it, and they have. They're trustworthy. They're good. They're, they handle things maturely and with respect, and until they cross that, there's no reason to put any constraints on them, and um, I trust them. But I had that when I was growing up. My mom and dad trusted me. I had freedom because I didn't abuse it. Wow. You're quite fortunate because, as we know, that's just not the case. You know what I mean? Um, so tell me a little bit more about their relationship and what you really want people to get out of this. I mean, it's 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 a real ebb and flow. It's a 300-page book, so there's a lot to read. There's a lot in there about these two people. And she's not very secure about herself because it's her first time, and she's thinking, why would a guy like Luke see anything in me because he's had experiences before? You know, when it brings out all the anxieties that girls are having. Right. I think Janie, Janie's our protagonist, and mm -hmm. I think she is a typical girl in that she's totally confident and yet completely insecure. Hmm. Right? She's confident with her ability in school and on the track team and on debate, but when it comes to feeling wanted, feeling deserving of being adored, she doesn't think she deserves it. She feels insecure. And I think that's such a typical thing, not just for young girls. I think women. I think a lot of women feel very confident in their jobs, in their friendships, in their family. But when it comes to their bodies, their relationships, their sexuality, it's so easy to feel unsure of yourself. You know, and I think we talked about this as well. A lot of that comes from um, maybe how you feel internally a little bit. But also when you're out of the workplace, when you're in school, you know, sometimes boys 
are really not that kind. That's and right. then we just sort of wear that for years and years as time goes by. We talked about Weinstein. Look what happened with him and all the people who's, who remain silent and all the people who continue to remain silent, in which case women, girls, just don't feel good about themselves. That's right. And the fact that you actually have a protagonist, that you have her in this story revealing all that and working through it in her life, in right. her junior year in school. Right. She acknowledges that it's because of Luke that she does feel worthy, that she does feel secure, that she just she is able to look herself in the mirror and feel beautiful. But she also acknowledges that she doesn't want to need a boy to say it in order to feel it. That at some point in her life, she's not going to have a boyfriend. She is going to be on her own. And she wants to have all those secure feelings alone. And in this book, you sort of, um, we travel with her through her year, falling in love with him. I can't believe he wants me. What are we going to do? Where are we going to do it? And actually discussing it with him. Do you think teenagers discuss this stuff or they just sort of go for it? You know, I think the culture for, for teenagers has changed a lot, sadly. I think mm. there's a, we've talked about this, a hookup culture now. The social media has changed things. So that's why I did want to paint this picture of a healthy first time where there is. Does that still exist? Because you're right, the whole hookup culture, that infuriates me a little bit. And I am by far not a nerd a, a, at all. Um, but it just seems that it's very fleeting, you know? You, know, you don't look, get to know anybody. I think the hookup culture is different than it was when we were growing up, but I don't think the human heart has changed. I think if you like somebody and you wake up in the morning after a hookup, you're still going to want to know they like you back. You're still going to want to know they would choose you over someone else the next night. I don't think human beings have changed. That's what I say to friends of mine who are doing that and younger friends of mine who are doing that. They're like, nah, you know, it was a fun time, and then we're just moving on, and I think oh my gosh, how could you feel that way? You know, you've really exposed a lot of yourself to someone, your heart and more, and then it's just over. That's why I found this book so healthy Thank and you. refreshing Thank and you. loving. Um, you got some great reviews on this, too. I Let's talk about that. Okay. Um, okay, where is it? Well, Kirkus um, yes. review was, uh, you know, said something about it's going to be passed from teen to teen under the cafeteria table or something to that effect. And The school library review, right? That's that was a starred review that just came about a week ago. That is amazing. It says, this is destined to be the classic and will undoubtedly be passed around from teen to teen as a word of mouth classic. I thought that was a terrific review. Yeah, I felt mean, good. your first time out, yeah, that's amazing. I'm not going to lie. That and then you're being compared to, you know, the Judy Bloom. Uh, which one? The, um, Forever. Judy Bloom Forever, which is really amazing because we know that that's something that inspired you, aside from 16 Candles right. um, with Luke. Yes. Um, so now what do you do with this? I mean, are you do you feel almost upon yourself a responsibility to talk, to really open up the conversation about teen sexuality? Because that's what this is going to do. It's going to open up a, a, in a very positive way because it's written in such a positive, you know, they had a positive experience. Thank you. I hope to. I hope to. When I was writing and I was thinking, I hope it's the kind of book that kids will read with a highlighter, but that parents would say to their kids, read this and settle for nothing less. Read this and know what a relationship could be like and could look like for you and your, you know, your future. You have a teen daughter. Do you think for the most part girls are confident with themselves or less confident than when we were growing up? I think they're so much more self-conscious now. Really? I do, because I think they're on display more. Hmm. And also, they have a window into what looks like other people's perfect lives all the time. And Ugh. other people's perfect bodies and perfect clothes and perfect hair. And of course, that, as we all know, that's just a highlight reel, what they see on Instagram or Facebook. But I think it just breeds insecurity in a lot of teenagers. I'm convinced that that's going to start to go away. Because how many times can kids or can we you know, put on our Instagram and see one more party and one more perfect dress and perfect little pinched in waist. Don't you think? Um, I always say to people, try, just try to take a picture of what you're looking at and not necessarily you looking at it, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Um, I saw your interview where you talked about that. Yeah, because yeah. I think that's just a bit of a turnoff doing that. And I just think it's, it's adding to our insecurities. But what about boys? Well, I think boys, there's a little less than th of that. However, I do know Snapchat is a real culprit when it comes to insecurity. And I've I've talked to people now that we're doing this college thing. And there's, there was an article in the New York Times recently about college and loneliness. 
And that's one thing kids are not prepared for, the getting there and feeling a little alone. And the problem is when they do have moments where they're alone in their dorm room and they're feeling a little uneasy, all they have to do is open their phone and on Snapchat it looks like everyone else is having a great time. And everyone else is among a million friends and at the best party. And it could really exacerbate your feelings of loneliness. So what do you want or what are you hoping that people take away, you know, well, if, uh, for fear of being repetitive, I hope people know what's possible. That you don't have to settle for feeling lousy the next morning. You don't have to settle for someone that doesn't make you feel good. That it's, it, it may, this book, I Never and the Relationship Between L Janie and Luke might be a bit of a fantasy. It is. It's a fantasy. And I wonder sometimes, this is such a beautiful story Thank you. that many things can happen. You can read it and say to yourself... I don't have that, but I'm going to go and look for it because I can get that too. I can believe in myself or say, ah, that's not possible. But that's very often the case when you're reading a book. I mean, there's a little fantasy rolled up into some reality as well. Right. And I'm hoping that when kids read this or adults, I actually think it's an, a great adult read. Thank I really you. did because it transformed me back. I went back into my time and it gave me some happy memories that just came flooded back for me. I'm glad to hear that. Um, yeah, it, re it really, really did. Are you going to do like book groups and stuff like that with young girls? I think so. I think that's the idea. And there was some conversation about a panel of um, Gen Zers to talk about their experience. And, and also the takeaway is just because if your first time is past and wasn't the way you would write it, there's an opportunity for a do-over. There's always an opportunity for a do-over. Um, do you sometimes look at this and say, oh, I'm thinking of a follow-up or you're just waiting for, because I can't give away the ending of what happens in this book, but you know, like I said, you're following these two people and you're following particularly her because I really, as I was reading and I really was relating to her, but mm -hmm. I told you for me, it brought out more, a little of my anxiety, but even though she was handling it well, it's almost like she had more support. You know what I mean? She had the support. Um, but do you feel like, I don't know, people are going to want to read more about these characters, more, more about her and more about what happens to him? Well, first things first, because I want I them to read this. Mm -hmm. So let's see if people, you know, are drawn to it and want more from Janie or more from Luke and Janie. Um, I hope that, I hope first things first, that the book finds its readers. What about people who say you're promoting sex before marriage? A lot of religious folks are going to say that once yeah. this hits the shelves, because they will. I expect to get some hate, but it's not the first book about teenage sex, so it's not like I blaze trails on that. Mm -hmm. Where are you going to be doing any readings, let's say, here in Los Angeles? Are you planning a, a tour? What are you thinking? There's an event at Children's Book World on November 11th. Where I'm gonna and that's here in L.A. on in Pico? LA. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, I used to live there with my kids, <laughs> right? And I'll be uh, in Denver at the Tattered Cover on Pub Day on November 7th. So a few little things here and there. Oh, that is terrific. Tell me a little bit more, though, about you when you were a kid. Um, you said your first experience was, was good, not great, but it was decent. It was good. Um, and because of that, do you feel like your re later relationships in life sort of followed that because you, it gave you a little confidence, your first relationship, sexual relationship? Yeah. I mean, as it's so not autobiographical. It would make sense to think that it was, but it really isn't. It's almost like what I wish for for every young person, you know, what, what or, and also when writing it thinking, what would I want to read if I were 16? And we also, we all want to read a little bit of the fantasy of what, what the, what the dream could be. I mean, I had, I grew up here in LA and my first boyfriend, it was his first, it was my first, it was perfectly fine. It was not, you know, the end all be all. It was not ever going to be forever, but it was fine and no regrets. But this is not. This story is not autobiographical. Give me a scenario with these two, if you don't mind, that you think is particularly touching in the book. There's a moment where they're together alone, and she wants it to be real dark. This is before they they have sex for the first time, and he doesn't get it, and she's self conscious about having any of her body. I'd imagine being 17 <laughs> and self-conscious. It's like, look, you want to be self-conscious. I mean. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Youth is wasted on the young. So he actually turns on the lights and takes her and stands her in front of a mirror and shows her herself through his eyes and says, look guy. at yourself and appreciate. And then that night after he leaves, she goes back to the mirror and is able to see a beautiful girl emerging, or maybe she's always been there. 
Wow. That's really amazing. I mean, because it also touches, the book also touches a lot on, of course, body image and how you see yourself. But again, you know, she also wants to see herself through herself and not just through him. But it was terrific that her first experience was with somebody who saw her well. Do you know what I mean? Right. Um, and I like the fact that she's strong enough where she wants to stand on her own. Mm -hmm. um, because I do think your first experience or your first one that matters does shape a lot of your future relationships. So if she can kind of have that strength and that knowledge and that confidence going into the rest of her romantic life, then she's one step ahead. Wonderful. So next up for you is the 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 uh, the book event over at um, uh, Children's, book World. Oh, the Children's Book World. And um, tell me a little bit more about working, working over at uh, Disney and a little bit about your, your life as an editor, as an executive book editor. Right. Oh, so I didn't mention before, when, when the idea hit me, I was not a book editor. I was not working at Disney. And so I started it, and I outlined it, and I wrote 30 pages. Then I got this job at Disney as a book editor, so I put this aside. I put, it's interesting um, how that happens, isn't it? Yeah. It was in your head. You worked it. Then you go over to Disney. And wow. I put the book aside, and I start working in publishing for the first time, and I'm really learning about the publishing business. And as I'm reading manuscripts and seeing what the editing process is, I think, let me pick that up again. And I did, and now, of course, there's a lot less time to write. So when kids are doing homework or on the weekends, I would try to write. My mantra was always a page a day. If I could write a page a day, then at some point this thing's going to be done. And um, at Disney, I have a terrific job. Disney has several imprints in their publishing house, and I edit all the books connected to ABC television shows and ESPN. I did um, a book with, for ESPNW. And, um, but the awareness of the publishing business gave me the – knowledge to finish this the, the right way the confidence, confidence actually yeah. right there's yeah. that confidence word again yeah. yeah no it's true but you know being your first time and it's not like you're a first time novelist at 20 right um is a little intimidating but I, it sounds to me like you had uh, a discipline about it you said you tried to do a page a day you know was there a particular place that you went and wrote this thing because there's a lot of people i know in in my circle who really want to write a book and are trying to get some something they want to do it, but they're not disciplined to do it. Any advice to people who have an idea? Well, uh, again, the page a day for, for me Works. was helpful because it's doable. It's mm -hmm. doable for everyone. And there are a lot of people that say they want to write a book. But it is. You know, there's a wonderful book by Elizabeth Gilbert called Big Magic. And it's all about harnessing your creativity. And she gives one example of, she says, don't treat your creativity like an old, boring marriage. Treat it like an affair. Have you ever noticed people, even busy, busy people who are having an affair, they find 15 minutes to make out in a hallway. So mm. <laughs> if you can treat your okay. creativity that way and find 15 minutes somewhere to have a session, to get some words out on the page, you got to work like a farmer if you really want to get something done. Okay. Terrific um, parting words, actually, from you. It's like, you know, treat your book like a 15-minute affair. I like that. <laughs> Get it where you can. Get it where you can. <laughs> All right, so the book is I Never by Laura Hopper, and how can we get copies of this? Amazon. Amazon's available for pre-order on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble, and it'll be uh, on sale in shel on shelves on November 7th. And if you don't have a teenage daughter, don't worry about it, because you'll <laughs> love it yourself. I love this book. Thank I told you, you it was Deborah. wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Okay, and we'll see you next time, everybody. Thanks for being here for another fun edition of Deborah Cobalt Live. Bye-bye.